are listening to Big World Network. Incubus, Season 5, Episode 8, written and read by Amanda Mavison. After dinner, when Alex announced that one of her last projects for the boys was knocking down a wall between two rooms, Nathan was all over it. Unfortunately, his crash on the sofa earlier led the others to believe he might not actually be well enough for all that hard labor, and he was denied. Nathan couldn't sit still, though, not after napping for so long. So without any new chores bestowed upon him, he snatched Sasha's scanner from their room. Nathan hadn't given the device much thought since he first saw it in Minnesota, a ruse at the time so Nathan and Jim wouldn't catch on that Sasha could sense incubus and succubus pheromones just fine on his own. No scanner needed. But the scanner did work for other creatures, and Nathan wanted to get it working as initially promised. After all, he needed the device more than Sasha or Jim, who could both sense most things naturally. And if there was ever another homicidal incubus or succubus around, he wanted to be prepared. He used this as an excuse to open the device up, without first asking permission. The crystal inside that powered its magic glowed purple, much like the ones on the goggles they had sold to Schuster all those months ago. The only thing Nathan needed to add to make the device light up for incubus pheromones along with the other things it detected was the right rune on the inside of the cover. He found what he needed from one of the gatehouse library books, a symbol that he figured translated closer to sex demon, but it should do the trick. He snapped the cover in place after adding the new etching with his knife and turned over his would-be tricorder. Nathan may not be fond of overly complicated technology, but he liked tinkering and wasn't as averse to this type of science meets magic, not like he used to be. He smiled proudly at what he hoped was a job well done and decided to seek Sasha out to see if it worked. He hadn't seen any of the others in some time, including Wally, and listened carefully for sounds of where they might be as he left the library. Coming to the end of the hallway near the landing, Nathan felt a strong surge of deja vu as he drew closer to Jim's door. He could hear Sasha and Jim's faint voices, just like he had earlier in the afternoon. As soon as he walked into Jim's room, however, he relaxed, because they weren't talking hushed or heated, their voices were faint because Sasha and Jim were out on the roof. There was access out Jim's window, which had been left open and was letting in all of the cold air from outside. Nathan could see the two of them out there, huddled around Sasha's laptop as they sat wrapped up in the comforter from Jim's bed. He shook his head. It was late December for crying out loud, and Missouri was not known for being tropical. You are so not getting any sympathy if you two get sick. Nathan said as he reached the window and started climbing out after them. Just what the hell do you think you're doing out here, geniuses? Because if you're watching porn, move over. He had to grin at that, especially since Jim looked over his shoulder and rolled his eyes. Nathan came up on Sasha's other side, already shivering at the cold temperature, even though he was wearing layers today with a button-down thrown over his t-shirt. It didn't take long to notice what the two of them were actually working on, considering the intricate mapping of dark fey activity on the computer screen. The wireless works better out here, and at least we thought to bring the blanket. Hey, did you mess with my scanner? Sasha asked, though he sounded more impressed than upset. You got it to pick up incubus pheromones? The scanner in Nathan's hand was already flashing from proximity to Sasha, but Nathan hadn't noticed, since his eyes were drawn to the computer screen. Apparently sex demon does mean incubus, he snorted. Just figured I should be prepared. Plus, it'll be easier to find you now. And I was bored. Now shove over, I'm freezing. He plopped himself down and flipped the scanner off before setting it aside. With a quirked smile, Sasha lifted the comforter and allowed Nathan to snuggle in beside him. They adjusted the blanket accordingly, but still all managed to fit underneath, and with three male bodies pressed together, it was fairly warm. 
So instead of enjoying our last bit of vacation, you two are wasting your time on me, Nathan asked, indicating the laptop. Nathan, Jim said in a frustrated tone, we've been over this. If we can track down the bounty holder, I might be able to use my powers to force them to release you. We wouldn't even have to kill them. We just need to find a dark fae who actually knows who they are. I'm not arguing, Nathan said. I just don't want either of you getting your hopes up too high. We've found dark fae already, dark she even, and they haven't been any help so far. How do we know the next time will be any different? If this dark she lord is as powerful as I'm guessing after our run-in with the dryads, then they probably keep their true name hidden from lesser fae. But that doesn't mean Dark Fae don't know who to turn the bounty into. Nathan blinked at Sasha, not understanding. Think of it like this, Sasha went on. Even though no one seems to know the bounty holder's true name, they still know who they are, because the muses and the dryads were all afraid of them. Dark Fae know how to turn the bounty in and to whom, but knowing another Fae's true name gives a certain amount of power, so at most we'd probably only get a pseudonym. We need to stop asking for a name and start setting up a trap instead. You mean a decoy, Nathan said. Get a dark fae to pretend to turn me in so we can catch this bounty holder without summoning them. The thought of those red on black eyes made Nathan's stomach turn sour and he suppressed a deep shudder at the thought of seeing them in person. Okay, risky move, but I guess it's better than nothing. My powers could be an asset for once, Jim said, and Nathan refrained from reminding him that the powers had been useful on several occasions. I could keep the bounty holder from taking you and make them let you go. We just need one more chance to find a dark fay who can help us. I really think we can do this, Nathan. Jim's hopeful tone made Nathan almost believe it, and almost forget that more was at stake than they were admitting. Using Jim's powers seemed to be what brought him closer to remembering what happened in the Vale, closer to those amber eyes maybe sticking around for good. But Nathan couldn't say that. He couldn't admit he had eavesdropped or that he feared Jim's awakening really was close at hand. Maybe hope and something else to focus on was all Jim would need to beat this. Then again, maybe saving Nathan would be the last step before Jim was truly lost. Nathan. Walter's voice startled Nathan. It had been days since he had heard it, after all. Nathan looked up and saw Walter perched on an overhang of roof off to his left, like some man-sized and yet somehow benevolent vulture. Apparently the power of the gatehouse didn't quite extend to the rooftop. Your mind weighs heavy with this. I understand. You must be cautious. This plan risks all of you, but could also be Jim's downfall as much as your own. You know as well as I do that his time is short, and as much as you may want to dismiss my warnings, there may not be anything you can do to prevent it. Nate? Jim prompted, as if perhaps he had asked Nathan a question. Huh? What do you think? The location in Maine sounds best to me. It's a longer trip, but seems more likely to be Dark Fay activity. Jim said, clicking away on the laptop keyboard to bring up several windows on a town called Ellsworth. We have more options for later, too, if Maine doesn't pan out. He continued reaching over Sasha to click through screens. Nathan stared ahead at Walter, watching the way his spirit guide's brown eyes glowed almost golden in the dark of the night, almost amber, as if to amplify the warning that Jim and Nathan's time was running out. Reaching over Sasha like Jim was, Nathan grabbed the laptop right off of Sasha's lap and pulled it out of both of their reach to his other side beside the scanner. He clicked the laptop closed. Nathan, Sasha said in irritation. This is important, Jim added. Yeah, Nathan agreed, and you've done a fine job, but I've got at least one more day of vacation time due and I'm not sitting through monster squad meetings for any of it. We know where we're headed next, and you've got some of the finer points down. Good. Good enough. Now can we move on to some mindless indulgences instead, please? It is New Year's Eve, after all. Nathan, Sasha, and Jim all turned toward the window in unison, surprised by Alex's voice. 
the lovely brunette was already climbing out onto the roof to join them, smartly dressed in a long wool sweater over her T-shirt and jeans. She carried a bag in one hand, perfectly sectioned to hold four bottles of wine. Wally clung to her shoulder. "'I was going to bring glasses,' she said, "'but they'd probably just get broken up here anyway.' Nathan grinned. Maybe the others had forgotten, but he had been paying more attention to the days, and had realized the date earlier and mentioned it to Alex. He hadn't expected her to respond like this, though, and it was a welcome surprise. Nathan couldn't help but think he might not get another year to usher in. Alex moved for Jim's free side, and snuggled under the now stretched to its limit comforter. Nathan noticed that Jim only looked slightly ruffled by her proximity against his side, while Wally scrambled down into Alex's lap to avoid the chilly air. Al, that's not even just halfway to awesome. That is full-blown awesome times three. Pop one of those babies open, Nathan said excitedly. We're not waiting until midnight? Sasha asked. Nathan let out a laugh. That's for tourists. Real men can drink whenever they want. And ladies? And hey, how exactly are you getting that thing open? He asked, glancing across the others as Alex pulled one of the bottles from the bag. You didn't think to bring a wine opener? Well, Alex said with something of a blush, then moved her gaze to Sasha. I was kind of hoping. She passed the bottle to the incubus, and he laughed. Sasha took the bottle in his left hand as his right formed claws. He stabbed his taloned thumb into the cork and pulled it cleanly out. I also do parties, he chuckled, as Jim politely plucked the cork off of his thumb and chucked it into a corner of the roof. Bottle opener gets first drink, Sasha finished with a grin, downing back a long swallow of wine. He licked his lips appreciatively before handing the bottle back to Alex at the start of the line. Nathan leaned forward to read over the bottle's label as Alex took her first drink. He didn't know wine, but he certainly didn't mind drinking it, especially when he didn't have to pay for it. This was a red with some sort of Spanish name. The alcohol content was impressive, but the wine tasted fantastic, something Nathan found out after his first swallow. He couldn't have beamed at the others any bigger. Walter stepped from his perch onto the main part of the roof with a sigh. Nathan continued to ignore him. He would have plenty of time for worrying later. Tonight he wanted to enjoy good wine and good company, and forget whatever might lie ahead. Not soon after, Walter turned and stepped dramatically off the edge of the roof to disappear into the night. Nathan decided to take the departure as a blessing. As the night progressed, Jim tried to keep Nathan from getting too many pulls on the bottle, or bottle number two, three, and four, worried that too much alcohol and his meds would be dangerous. But he wasn't very successful at stopping Nathan, and soon Nathan was blissfully buzzed. He hadn't had any other drinks in more days than he could count because of the meds, but damn it, this was a special occasion. Yep, totally slept with her, Jim laughed. After we'd only just met her, too. He laughed again and down the last of bottle number four, to which Sasha whined and then snagged the empty bottle afterwards. I didn't expect Nate to actually date Wade, so I wasn't surprised when things didn't work out. Hey, she cheated on me, Nathan protested. Yeah, well, according to Wade the Psychic, you would have eventually done it yourself. Eventually and having actually done something are two different things. Alex giggled, glassy-eyed and content-looking, as she leaned into Jim and stroked the sleeping chimera in her lap. Sasha tossed the empty wine bottle over to where they had tossed the others and scowled. Even his bright blue eyes looked glassy. He pouted at Nathan and said, "'Are you disappointed? Wishing you were still with her?' Nathan let out a boisterous laugh that would have jostled his wounds if he wasn't numb from the drugs and alcohol. Hell no, she's crazy. Not my type at all. She was just hot. Is hot. I don't have any regrets, believe me. Especially not now. He waggled an eyebrow at Sasha, which pushed the pout into a grin. Well, you do seem to enjoy yourself with me, Sasha said. Then, before Nathan could even hope to react, Sasha was climbing on top of him, disrupting the comforter from the other's shoulders as he pinned Nathan to the roof and kissed him hard. 
Nathan and his wine and medication riddled brain didn't mind at all. Sasha's larger body on top of his, that warmth and enveloping presence, not to mention how Sasha's sweet tasting tongue plunged deeply, and his hands traveled down Nathan's sides, like he wanted to strip Nathan down right there on the roof. While Nathan had forgotten about his wounds, Sasha was careful enough not to press their chests together. He just laid there gently on top of Nathan. It wasn't long before Nathan felt that familiar heat beginning to pool, especially with the way Sasha's tongue moved against his own, those soft hands slipping up underneath Nathan's shirts to feather up his belly. "'Hey!' came Jim's dissenting voice, sounding far, far away. "'None of that while we're still here,' he said. And before Nathan could complain, Sasha was being pulled off of him and rolled onto his back between the two brothers. Nathan mourned the loss of Sasha's weight and heat, but Sasha was laughing, and when Nathan glanced over, he saw that Jim and Alex were lying back on the comforter now, too, and the redhead had rolled onto his other side, facing Jim. "'Sorry, Jimmy,' the incubus said. "'I'd say you can join in, but I don't think Nathan would appreciate that. "'Or Alex. Hmm. "'Or maybe she would.' Nathan lifted up a little to better see the others, and watched as Sasha planted a sloppy kiss right on Jim's lips. Alex started giggling uncontrollably, but the reaction from Jim, an expression somewhere between a grin and a grimace, was enough to send Nathan into a fit of giggles, too. Sasha soon joined them. They had definitely drunk that wine way too fast. By the time their laughter had stilled, and they were silent again, Nathan's head was whirling, and thinking clearly or not, he knew just where he wanted the conversation to go. Drunken confessions were always the easiest to weasel out. Hey, he said, pushing Sasha's shoulder with his hand, I want to hear the story. What story? You and Alex, Nathan said, grinning mischievously. There's a story there about how she knows what you are. I know it. You always evade me, he added with a look at Alex. Alex simply stared back at him as cryptically as ever, resettling a stirring wally on her chest after having disrupted the chimera when they laid back. Jim frowned, but looked insanely curious. Sasha's face went almost white. It's not what you think. It was an accident. I hadn't fed in almost a month. So you did sleep with her, Nathan accused, even though he didn't really care about past involvements, especially not when he was halfway to drunk, or all the way. I knew it. Next thing I know, you'll be saying you slept with Jim. This time, both Sasha and Jim let out loud, rancorous laughs. That'd never happen, Sasha assured Nathan. Then he turned to Jim. Not that you're not hot, mind you, he said. Appreciate it, Jim nodded. Nathan snorted. Right, his brother was hot. Alex giggled again, like they were all just too ridiculous. Am I even here, she asked. I'm part of this story too, you know, and you're already way off. Sasha and I never slept together. Nathan's brow furrowed. But he just said, I said I needed to feed, and that Alex finding out what I really am was an accident. I never said I fed from her. Sasha looked across at Alex, who stared back steadily at him, leaving the decision in his hands whether or not to tell the rest. Finally, Sasha sighed and hung his head. Okay, I'll tell you, but you have to understand this wasn't something I planned. It was a long time ago. I was... Eighteen, I think? I'd stupidly gone too long without feeding, and I was in bad shape. I couldn't even control the glamours anymore. My eyes were red, my fangs out, my fingers black and almost claws. I figured I was screwed. There was no one I could go to for help, because I couldn't tell anyone the truth. So I decided to come to the gatehouse, and let whatever seals might be here take care of me. The realization of what Sasha meant by that sobered Nathan more than he wanted to admit, and he frowned. All remaining giggles ceased, and a silence fell over the others as Sasha went on. So I scrambled inside, late one night, trying to find a room where there might be someone, anyone who'd stop me before I hurt someone. I didn't realize I'd gone into Elaine's room until she came in. That got Nathan's attention. Elaine Ferris was Alex's mother. 
She died a couple years ago, but had always run the gatehouse like a pro. Nathan had often thought of her like another mother, or at least a long-lost aunt. Once she realized it was me, we'd met briefly when I'd come through there before, she wouldn't listen to a word I said, just told me to keep as much control as I could, so she could help me. I told her it was too dangerous, but she... She said if feeding was all I needed, there was no way she'd let a seal kill me for nothing. I managed to keep enough control not to hurt her or take too much, but I'd let almost all of the glamours drop to make sure my focus was on being careful with how I fed. My wings were spread out behind me over the bed as we finished, and... And that was about the time I walked in. Nathan gaped at Alex, imagining Jim's expression had to look just as stunned, though he couldn't see his brother's face, since it was turned toward her. That was not the story Nathan had been expecting all this time. Oh, I almost screamed and brought the whole gatehouse down on him, but Mom was quick, Alex said. She explained, Sasha transformed human, we all went to bed, and things were awkward for, well, a while. After Mom died... I don't know. I guess it seemed silly to care about something like that, so I told Sasha to suck it up. We've been on good terms ever since. Mom saved his life. Now he might be the only thing that can save yours. Her eyes stared fixed at Nathan. It was what it was, Sasha said. Don't make a big deal out of it. We never did. Silence settled over them again, and the cold started creeping in enough that they all sat up and huddled under the comforter like before. Eventually, the somber mood was too much for Nathan. He was close enough to drunk to not want the night to end on a sour note, especially not on New Year's. You know, I always thought of Elaine as a MILF, just never figured that to be so close to the truth. One of Alex's shoes thrown at Nathan's head later, and they were laughing again. You're listening to Big World Network.